We're thrilled to have welcomed our first grandbaby recently. But growing this precious human hasn't been easy on our daughter. The unrelenting pregnancy fatigue really took it out of her. One thing that helped was keeping her fluids up. And she loved Rehydrate. Rehydrate is an essential electrolyte drink made by some great guys right here in Brizzy. It's safe during pregnancy and breastfeeding and is like a magical little energy and hydration boost for mum and bub. If you're growing a little human or are just feeling a little run down, grab some at Coles today. Every family is responsible for their own values, but it doesn't always work so well. It's the Happy Families Podcast. The podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. Hello, my name's Dr. Justin Coulson. I'm the author of six books about raising happy kids. And I'm here with my wife, my co-host, my podcast partner, and the mum of our six children, Mrs. Happy Families herself, Kylie Coulson, who, let's face it, every now and again, parenting is pretty stressful, right? You're going to tell a story. I can just feel it. And every now and again, we get so distracted with everything that's going on that we don't really notice certain things like our telephone and our pants when we jump into the pool. (laughs) (laughs) You had to tell that story. Well, so so the the weather is warming up and um, we we ride the kids to school every morning. We love the, uh, the opportunity to do that. We've never done it before, but with the children having changed schools this term, They've started nice riding and close. nice and close. We have started riding to school, and um, in the last few days, I've started jumping in the pool when I get home because I'm hot and sweaty. And that was one of the conditions of moving to Queensland. If we're moving to Queensland, we must have a pool. Uh, and uh, you just jumped in the pool and forgot that your phone was in your pocket. Yeah, the problem is I remembered mid air. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I, I wasn't getting in the pool, but I've heard you scream, and I thought, oh, the water must be cold. And next thing, you're like, get the phone and. Handed me this sogging wet phone, which I went and put straight into the rice, and it's okay. Everything's working. Well, they say they're, you know, water resistant. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping we'll get through that one without too much angst. It's a, it's a recent model iPhone, and I'm grateful that we haven't had to replace it because that would have definitely hurt. Well, last week we had a conversation around triggers and what things really set parents off, and it wasn't until um, the end of our discussion that she's hitting me. And She's hitting me. Yeah. She's breathing my air. <laughs> Another one came to mind and I thought this was a really good one that we really needed to kind of unpack a little bit. You know, that whole conversation around, but mom, everyone else is doing it. Oh, yeah. I'm the only one that's not allowed. I'm the only one that doesn't have a phone. Yeah, totally. And, and as a parent, it kind of puts you in two places. You can either feel absolute pressure because you're the only parent who's not letting your child do this or you're in that position where your children hate you. <laughs> they, yeah. they hate you because even though all of your reasons are good reasons, it still leaves them feeling like they're the only one who doesn't. And they feel like they're on the outer, they're, they're ostracised. As you were saying that, I was thinking of uh, The Princess Bride when the Dread Pirate Roberts is coming into the castle and it's Andre the Giant with the with the, the, the cloak that's burning and, and you, you've got that – the guard outside the castle saying, stand your ground, men, stand your ground. And I'm thinking as parents, we we, we want to stand our ground, but we're looking around petrified because there's this giant burning ball of fire coming towards them. We're like, oh no, do, do I stand my ground or do I run and just give them the castle? Well, and I think, you know, too, uh, as a parent, you've got it. That's a really good imagery. That's really good imagery. But as a parent, I think that sometimes – We've got to be able to see things with with clear vision and perspective. And are we actually stopping our children from doing things that, you know, are actually age appropriate and they should be able to do? Are we being a bit of a stick in the mud or are we actually doing something that's actually beneficial for our children, keeping them safe? Yeah, well, we need to do an episode on when is the right age for your kids to get a phone, but that's not for today. While you were saying that, that reminded me of, I was doing a, um, a, a presentation at a really fancy school in one of Melbourne's uh, more affluent suburbs. Uh, the, the hall was packed. There must have been 400 450, 500 parents in the room. And we were talking about boys and gaming. We were talking about this screen issue for boys. It it was a boys school, hence the topic. And uh, I I had a lady towards the end of my talk, put up her hand. She was towards the front. I called on her. I said, what's your question? And she said, how do I not buy that game for my son? Uh, and, And basically what she was saying is, he's telling me all the other kids are doing it. I'm the only one that hasn't got it. And have you noticed they're always the only one? 
they're all allowed to do it. I'm the only one that's not allowed to do it. Oh, and and by the way, if you don't, I'm just going to go to my friend's house and do it anyway. Like he's not saying that, but that's that's the underlying. We know that that's what they'll do. And and whether it's phones or games or whatever it is, I heard this pleading in this mum's voice. You know, it might be sleepovers, the sleepover party, or it might be drinking Coca-Cola, or it might be whatever it is that you've got a personal value around that you say, we don't do that and everyone else is doing it. I heard this mum say, how do I not buy the game? And I kind of called her on her. I said, well, are you saying how do you not hand over your credit card and swipe it or tap it so that he can have it? And she said, no, 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 that's not really what it is. I don't want him to play these violent games, but he can get access to them regardless. And he's too young and they're not for kids that age. And I paused her right there and I, I spoke to all of the parents in the room. I said, can you hear this, mum? What she's really saying is, You've got a 12 or 13 or 14-year-old kid who wants to play an R-rated 18-plus game, and this mum doesn't want her son to play the game. And my guess is that most of you in the room feel the same way. And yet what happens is everyone's looking around and going, but everyone else is doing it, so what's the point? But is everyone else doing it? I don't think they are. And in fact, when I got them to raise their hands, most of them weren't. And most of them were on her side. And they were like, no, we don't want them to be doing it either. So uh, there is that whole stand your ground thing that's real. But we've also got to work out, well, I think we need to come up with a couple of useful take-home strategies to, to, to help when the kids say, but everyone else is doing it. Let's do that next. It's the Happy Families Podcast. Imagine a home where discipline got results without anyone having to feel bad or in trouble. The Do's and Don'ts of Discipline is a webinar to help parents set limits with love, compassion and humanity. Find it now at happyfamilies.com.au slash shop. It's the Happy Families podcast with Dr. Justin Coulson and my wife, Kylie, and we asked people on the street what it is that their kids always say, oh, but mum, but dad, everyone else gets to do it. I say, oh, everyone else is doing it, are they? Oh, who? And they'll say, oh, you know, um, Sophie's allowed to do it or Lucy's allowed to do it. And I'll say, oh, well, good, go and live at their house then and then you'll be able to do it. My four-year-old daughter says, um, if you don't buy that toy that my friend has, I will not call you a nice daddy. My friends have mobile phones and they're only in grade four and I'm in grade six. Playing Minecraft and having a phone. Always, always. So what do you think we're actually supposed to do in this situation? Well, in our house, I mean, speaking personally, uh, we've got a fairly standard response and I guess it's almost a bit of a tough love response. We, we try to couch it in empathy and kindness, but essentially we say every family has their own rules and in our home, these are our rules. We, we do it gently. We explain the reason for it. We explore how they're feeling and then we let them know that they're the rules. But but I don't know if that's going to be – I mean, I think that's the best way to do it. Every house is – every family is responsible for their own values, but it doesn't always work so well. No, and I think that like we said in the beginning, you know, this feeling of pressure of being the only one on both sides as a parent, being the only one stopping your children from doing these things and then as a child feeling like the only one who isn't involved. Um, and so I think one of the things that's, you know, I, I keep going back to this this thought process of it takes a village to grow a child. It's one of my favourite catchphrases and yeah, it's been used a lot. But I think about the fact that, um, you know, as we build a community around our children, we talk to other parents and we start to get a sense of, you know, where they are at and what things they're doing. And in our case, multiple times when our children have come to us and said, you know what, mum, we're the only ones not doing this. And I've had conversations with multiple parents have found out that that's Nobody's not the truth. doing it. That's yeah, exactly yeah. right. And so I found strength in numbers as a parent, having other parents who are supporting me and my decisions to keep my children safe. Because at the end of the day, we're all in the same boat. We all want to keep our children safe. That kind of goes back to the conversation that I had with the mum in the hall at that school that night. She's basically saying, can I please recruit every parent in this room to help me to keep my son safe? And whether it's whether it's the pool party or whether it's the slumber party or whether it's the video games or the telephone or whatever it is that everyone else is allowed to do it and why can't I, the point here is oh, – but, but, you know, one of the challenges with that is that the community, the village, isn't what it 
used to be, or at least it's not my, my perception is that it's not what it used to be. I don't know that the connections, that the relationships are as strong. I reckon there'd be so many parents listening to this saying, I don't really know who the parents are at my school. I drop the kids off in the car park. I pick them up in the car park, but I just, you know, it's the drive through. That's what a lot of schools do. You drive in, you get your child in the car and you keep on driving. We don't have the same quality of village that we perhaps might have. And I agree totally and I think that's why it's, it's so important that we're intentional. We're intentional about the time that our children spend with their friends and, and you know, taking time to actually initiate conversations yeah. with those parents. Yeah, it's when really you drop important. the kids off, go knock on the door, say hi to the mum and dad, have a 10-minute conversation. I hope yeah. you don't mind me intruding. I just thought I'd say good day and get to know you. Our children seem to like spending time together. I thought we should get to know each other. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's only through that process that you can kind of start to, you know, support one another in this whole parenting game. It's huge. Okay, here's my last idea. I think, to go back to something that you mentioned way earlier, developmentally, our children may actually be ready for some of the things that all the other kids are doing. Well, I was going to tell you about an experience I had in relation to that. When I was 12, everyone else had shaved their legs, but my mum would not let me do it at all. It was just an absolutely taboo conversation. We weren't even going there. I was not allowed to shave my legs. I was the only girl in my grade. You literally were the only girl. I literally was the only girl in my grade. And it took another woman, another mum, to sit down with my mum and say, you know what? What's what's so big about this? You know, why have you got a, you know, a A hang up, a hang up over this? And she's she's too young. She's well, actually, no, she's not. She's almost a teenager. And and this is age appropriate. And so it was because of that mum standing up to my mum that I was actually able to do it. And it was such it was such a momentous occasion for me because I had waited for so long. Most of my friends have been doing it from the time they were nine or ten. But I had listened to my mum, tried to be obedient, but was getting to the point where it was just like – Starting to affect your self-esteem. It really was. Yeah. So I think if we were to summarise the take-home message, number one, we can and should stand our ground – when it's completely reasonable to do so. But we want to do it in a spirit of understanding. So this is the second take-home message. We want to make sure that we really get what's going on for our children and we know that it's a reasonable thing that we're asking. Now, when it comes to genuinely deeply held values, it's probably worth standing your ground. But it's worth also creating those conversations and having the interaction with your children and with others to ask the questions, be a bit vulnerable and get that feedback. One of the things I think has been really important for us as we've discussed these kinds of conversations with our children is is allowing them to feel like they're part of the process. You know, they're not, they're not happy with our decision, but as we include them in, you know, dialogue around why we feel so strongly about our standing point, um, it allows mutual understanding to happen. And as a result of that, our relationship stays intact. And while they still might not necessarily agree with it, they understand it. That's what the best research shows. They've got to understand the rationale and they've got to have a sense of a sense of ownership, a sense of autonomy in there. Really appreciate you listening to the podcast. If you do enjoy the podcast, please visit Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review. Those ratings and reviews help other people to discover the podcast and have happier families. The Happy Families podcast is produced by Justin Rulon and our executive producer is Craig Bruce. If you'd like more information about how we can make your family happier, we've got these memberships. They're available at happyfamilies.com.au or you can follow us for free on Instagram or on Facebook at Dr. Justin Coulson's Happy Families. Happy Families.